Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, wonderful to see such a great uh, turnout here this morning. Uh, my name is Richard Downey. Um, I'm Deputy Director of the Africa Program here at CSIS. Uh, welcome uh, to the latest event in our Statesman's uh, Forum series, in which we invite uh, prominent world leaders to present their views about critical policy issues uh, before a public audience uh, in Washington and uh, on the web as well today. Uh, it's a great pleasure this morning to welcome back to CSIS the Prime Minister of Kenya, Raila Odinga. Uh, I think the last time uh, you were with us, uh, Prime Minister, was uh, back in early summer of uh, 2008, only a few months uh, after the presidential election crisis had died down. Uh, here in the United States, I think uh, many of us who'd got uh, accustomed to thinking of Kenya as a, a stable and peaceful country were jolted somewhat out of our complacency by those events. Uh, since then, we've been following uh, events very closely, and we're glad that Kenya, such a close friend of the United States has started to pick itself up from that traumatic experience. Uh, but it's been a tough road. Uh, uh, there's been a lot of soul searching uh, and compromises and tough decisions have had to be made. Uh, and Prime Minister, you've uh, had to make more than most uh, adjusting to the stresses and strains of a power sharing government while trying to put Kenya back on the right footing by addressing some of those structural problems and grievances which led to the explosion of violence in those closing days of 2008 and opening weeks of 2000, uh, sorry, opening weeks of 2008. Uh, one of the key challenges still to be overcome is how to break out of this destructive cycle, uh, which we see in, in so many countries uh, in Africa, uh, where politicians have sought to win electoral support by making ethnic appeals, uh, emphasizing divisions rather than trying to bridge them. Uh, now in Kenya, uh, a very important breakthrough last summer was uh, passing a constitution which would uh, provide a framework for getting beyond some of these divisions. Uh, it's the standout achievement, I think, so far of the Grand Coalition Government, uh, strongly endorsed by the Kenyan people in a referendum. The challenge, of course, uh, is the implementation. Uh, the jury is still out on whether who will prevail, the reformers uh, or those who wish to defend the status quo. But I'm very pleased to count the Prime Minister as a member of the reformist uh, camp. Uh, I'm looking forward to him speaking this morning about those outstanding challenges, perhaps in the questions afterwards about the Constitution. Other big challenges since the last election, of course, have been addressing the root causes of the violence and bringing to justice the main orchestrators of that violence. Uh, the International Criminal Court has become the venue for that investigation. Uh, and the six suspects, including cabinet ministers, uh, have within the past week appeared at The Hague to answer summonses in relation to that inquiry. Now, of course, the need to address these issues and the wider causes of violence become all the more urgent as Kenya once more prepares to enter another election cycle in 2012. So next summer's elections will be a major test of how far Kenya has come since 2007. Now, at the heart of all these challenges I've outlined is the need for good governance. And so it's uh, very fortunate this morning that the Prime Minister has uh, indeed chosen this theme, good governance and democracy, as the subject of his address. Uh, and we're looking forward to hearing his remarks uh, touching on Kenya, but also the broader challenges, I think, of good governance in Africa, uh, in which he's been personally invested uh, recently uh, in his uh, unique experience he's been able to offer of uh, power sharing government at home, uh, lending uh, his support to mediation efforts by the AU, the African Union, uh, in the likes of Ivory Coast, also closely following events in uh, another power sharing uh, government uh, that's unraveling in Zimbabwe. So we're going to be very interested to hear his views on, on these crises and the other challenges of governance in the African continent, particularly this worrying tendency of contested election outcomes which is popping up in so many countries. So, so much to talk about. We're very grateful for such a timely visit. Uh, with that, I'll hand over to the Prime Minister uh, and afterwards we'll hopefully have plenty of time uh, for members of the audience to ask questions as well. So, uh, Mr. Odinga, welcome. Thank you, thank you uh, very much um, for such a very elaborate uh, introduction. Uh, 
Well, I say good morning. Uh, in Swahili, we say hamjambo. Uh, well, um, first, uh, allow me to express my appreciation for the opportunity you've given me to address you this morning. The Center for Strategic and International Studies is one of the world's leading think tanks, and I believe its reputation is thoroughly deserved. I have had occasion to talk to you on varying subjects, and each time I come here, I come wiser than I came into the audience here. Your crucial work looking for solutions to foreign policy, security, and development problems continues to have a tremendous impact on the international community. I want to speak to you this morning on a subject that is causing growing anxiety among many of us in Africa and most of you here with us this morning. That subject is what appears to be the democracy deadlock in Africa. Is democracy under siege in Africa? Are we progressing or are we regressing? That is actually the subject I want to talk about. There's real fear in Africa that a new pattern of failing elections is emerging. It is all the more alarming that this represents a sharp regression. After the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, we saw in Africa the emergence of what we called the Second Liberation. This established or re-established multi-party political systems and demanded greater transparency and accountability in the management of national affairs. It swept out some of those old dictators and began a new era that promised an end to election rigging. And in some ways, it has worked. Most African countries have re-established multi-party democratic systems there has been competitions, and there has been appreciable um, progress that has been made. This is actually evidenced by the increased growth that we have registered on the continent. In average, most African countries or economies have registered above five percentage growth over the last 10 years. And today, elections are vigorously contested across the continent. Since 2007, at least 10 African countries have held presidential or parliamentary votes or constitutional referenda. This year, 21 nations will go to the polls. Opposition parties are better organized. Election monitoring is more effective and voters are better informed. People are no longer silent in the face of election fraud, and African leaders can no longer guarantee themselves landslide victories like in the past. They know they will face challenges at the polls and that they could lose to their opponents. For the first time in its history, Africa also has retired presidents. Since 2000, more than 10 presidents have retired when their allotted terms have finished. Previously, power changed hands only by violent overthrow or assassination, or when old men died. But unhappily, some problems have arisen, and there are fears that much of Africa could be drifting towards a new authoritarianism. A significant worrying pattern is emerging of a troubled ballot. Closely fought elections with heavily disputed results are becoming the norm. Incumbents are coercing electoral commissions to skew the polls in their favor, and then when their opponents protest, they are resort to force. Many thousands die and are displaced until the internal community steps in, the international community steps in 
in, uh, to work out some kind of power sharing arrangement. And this is what you've seen happen recently in Cote d'Ivoire. I'm sure you are all aware of the Kenyan situation where the presidential election results were disputed and the problem was resolved by an internationally mediated power sharing arrangement. This was not exactly an export to be proud of, but now, alarmingly, it seems to have become a new tool for dictators. It is a template that was enthusiastically embraced by Mr. Robert Mugabe of Zimbabwe, who used it to resolve his own rigged elections. An equal power is characteristic of a coalition government with incumbents grabbing the land share. In Zimbabwe, Mugabe's side retained control of the military, police, and security services, what you can call the instruments of power, leaving their coalition partners with economic development and reconstruction. Mugabe's coalition partners was thus expected to rebuild the nation after conflict, while being undermined by Mr. Mugabe's side. The result has been deadlock in government and paralysis in the country. Kenya's case is not dissimilar. Most damaging of all, the coalition arrangement in Kenya and its inherent tensions have meant that preparing for the next election has been almost a continuous since the conclusion of the last one. This has distracted from critical day-to-day -day issues and has often rendered Parliament a theatre of the absurd. The lesson being learned here is that power sharing is at best a deeply unstable temporary measure with the negative long-term consequences. The continent has seen other depressing developments. In Gabon and Togo, the deaths of long-serving dictators, Omar Bongo and Nasimbe Eadema, created room for elections in which power was smoothly transferred to their sons. Mauritania, Guinea, Madagascar, and Niger have all had coups since 2008, in most cases because of the incumbent's refusal to transfer power. In some other countries, elections are being won by incumbents after intimidation of opposition supporters. A number of other countries have held massively flawed elections that left hundreds of protesting opposition supporters dead. Opposition parties have subsequently been vandalized and many oppositionists jailed making them unable to compete in the subsequent elections. It is telling that for the past two years, the Mo Ibrahim Foundation, which offers the world's richest prize to African leaders who help develop their countries and then peacefully leave office, has decided to make no awards. No leaders mess the standards. There have been a few bright spots, however, such as Ghana, where presidents have twice conceded defeat and handed over power to leaders from the opposition, and Botswana and Benin are two others. South Africa has consistently exercised democratic, free and fair elections with a free media, despite the African National Congress dominance of the post apartheid politics. But those countries that have done well are overshadowed by and, and outnumbered by the great majority where backsliding has occurred. Last year, Freedom House, which is based in this city, found that political freedoms had declined in 10 countries on the continent in 2009 and improved in just four. This growing trend away from democracy 
includes not only pariah states such as Eritrea and Sudan, but also such key Western allies and recipients of foreign aid as my own country, as well as Ethiopia and Uganda, where troops have functioned as the de facto Western proxies in battling radical Somali Islamists in Mogadishu. The West's reluctance to challenge autocratic regimes appears driven by security concerns, leading to the fear that global politics might once again be pushing the world to tolerate dictatorship in Africa, just as it did in the Cold War. And we all know what happened during the Cold War. Uh, in those days, the enemy was communism, so long as you said that um, you are an ally of the West in the war against communism, nobody cared how you ran your country. You are tolerated. That is how we created Mobutu Sese Seko, Kungu Wazabanga of this world. That is how we created Kamuzu Bandas, Jean Badel Bokatsa, Idi Amin Dada, and so on. The questions. Everyone had a vested interest, and everyone turned a blind eye. All this is happening when groups such as the U.S. Agency for International Development and the U.K.'s Department for International Development are striving for the U.N. aid goal of 0.7% of the gross national income to ensure Millennium Development Goals are met. But if governance is bad, no amount of aid money will lift African countries out of poverty. We have to fix the politics first. So ladies and gentlemen, I have always been an Afro-optimist, and developments in Africa give me more reason to be hopeful about the future of the continent. Some of our governments and civil societies have woken up to the fact that regular multi-party elections alone do not lead to good governance, the rule of law, and economic development, and that elections have not eradicated corruption, repression, and underdevelopment. People are demanding more than just trappings. They want constitutional changes that create inclusivity, stability, responsibility, proper separation of powers, effective checks and balances, and independent judiciary and media, and clear election schedules, and full limits on presidential terms and powers. Some nations are also working to end inter-ethnic tension through the devolution of power and union federalism, and to combat corruption by limiting the power of the executive and increasing government transparency. I can proudly say that Kenya leads the pack in taking proactive steps. Last year, we promulgated a new constitution that limits executive power, sets dates for elections, devolves control of resources, and sets stringent integrity and accountability requirements for leaders. I believe the idea will spread. Events in Libya, Egypt, Côte d'Ivoire, and Tunisia have shown that the people are ready to take on those who abuse power and deny the majority their due. It is also a mark of progress that the African Union summoned up the courage to take a stand in the Ivory Coast and tell the now deposed Lauren Gbagbo that he had been defeated and must leave office. As the, middle, as the middle class emerges and forms critical mass, as modern economy develops and professionals establish their associations and codes, and as educated youth becomes a large majority of the population, surely the yearning for true democracy will rise. It will rise to the extent that the old order can no longer contain. The peaceful birth of a new African nation, the Southern Sudan, is a case in point. 
This is a cause for celebration. Celebration of the democratic rights of the poorest of the poor. The culture of democratic constitutionalism has definitely taken root in parts of Africa, often thanks to citizens and civil society activists determined to make everyone count, uh, vote count. Progressive leaders are emerging. I believe that if this determination on the part of the people is but traced by the support of the international community, hope is alive that these early years of the 21st century can finally see the true blossoming of the African continent. But to stay its course in charting this surer destiny, Africa needs your support. I remain optimistic that the African, African democratization process that has been ongoing since we started, since independence emerged on the continent, is coming of age. That this 21st century is truly going to be the African century. This is the century in which we are going to see the mobilization of the massive resources that Africa has, natural and human, for faster socio-economic development of the continent. The African continent is on the upward trend. Most of the economies are now registering between 5 to 10 to 12 percent growth. It can only go upwards. I am confident that Africa will truly emerge. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Prime Minister, for uh, such a broad and wide-ranging uh, address. Uh, we have a good portion of time uh, for questions. Uh, and uh, I thought maybe I'll use my prerogative as the chair and, and kick things off and, and talk about a country we've spent a lot of time worrying about and following here in, in recent weeks and months, and, and one that you've been involved with uh, directly, and, and that's Cote d'Ivoire. Um, perhaps you could talk a little bit more about your role in, in trying to end that uh, uh, post-election dispute. It, it seems that Bagbo was given so many, uh, plenty of opportunities for a, a, a soft landing, an honorable exit, uh, rejected them all, uh, eventually was, was ousted by force. How, is it, how important do you think it is for the credibility of, of democracy in Africa that this crisis has, we hope, been resolved? That, Feel free to sit down or speak at the podium, whichever you prefer. Okay. Well, um, it is very unfortunate that Bagbo had to go the way he did. And I advised him that um, he needed to take the offer that was being given to him. I wanted to be known that uh, among the two, I know Mr. Bagbo more, longer. He's been... Um, a colleague for a very long time, um, when he was the real leader of uh, the democratization uh, uh, struggles in the Côte d'Ivoire, um, when he was also in exile. And we actually started what the, the Socialist International African chapter together. Um, I also know Mr. Watara very well as um, an international uh, civil servant. When he was here with the IMF, um, he's also come to Kenya. So we've had um, a, a long relationship uh, with both of them. So I tried to use my closeness to try to bring understanding. And I told Mr. Bagbo clearly that um, all the evidence available showed that he had lost elections and that all the observer teams that had observed elections had said that he had lost. Of course, he insisted, it's a language that we're used to, that he won and that the Electoral Commission, uh, which had been, which, had, uh, which co consisted of most of his opponents, had rigged the elections. 
that he wanted the result to be verified, uh, that he wanted the AU to send, up, send a team of impartial people to go and verify the results. I told him that, you know, um, I also won an election. <laughs> But I'm not the president. <laughs> so <laughs> that is not the most important thing. I think the most important thing is Coup d'Ivoire. And I told him that, you know, I was asked to go to the court and challenge the results um, which uh, had been announced by the Electoral Commission. I refused to go to court. Uh, why? Because uh, we, I had no confidence in the courts. The courts were not independent. The courts were appointed by the same executive that I was challenging. And the Electoral Commission also had been uh, set up, appointed single-handedly by the executive. So it was not neutral or, or independent. Um, then I, they said we should have the results verified. I said no. As why? I said because those ballot papers had been in the custody of the same electoral commission which had done the rigging. And the chances that they had been tampered with were very high. So in your case, it is the reverse. These ballot papers you are talking about have been in custody of the court, the constitutional court, all this time. The chances that they had been tampered with are very high. So even if they are verified and it found that you won, nobody will believe you. It is an exercise in fertility. So you must therefore go for a political settlement. And the political settlement is that the world perceives that you have lost. And politics is about perception. You may not have lost, but that is what the world believes. And the conditions in the Côte d'Ivoire does not allow for a repeat of another election in the next foreseeable future. So you better agree and negotiate a political deal. He agreed he was going to, but then he changed his mind. I gave him an offer which I had been given to take up lectureships elsewhere, even in this country, and that um, they would not be persecuted, and that uh, Watara would agree to incorporate part of his people in a government of national unity. All that he would say yes, but then tomorrow he would say no. One, there were the generals who would not hear of that. And then, of course, there's always a woman somewhere in the equation. <laughs> <laughs> Not that uh, <laughs> that is not demeaning <laughs> to women at all. I am very gender sensitive. <laughs> but um, I told him that to avoid bloodshed, unnecessary bloodshed where innocent civilians would die, it was better for him to make a, take a deal. He refused to take a deal, and therefore we ended up the way we ended up him being now taken in um, almost as a captive. I have since uh, had the occasion to send a message to Mr. Watara that um, he should guarantee Mr. Bagbo's safety for the sake of Côte d'Ivoire, that he should not be harmed, and that um, uh, if he wants to go into exile, he should be allowed to go into exile somewhere. If he wants to remain in the country, he can remain so long as it does not interfere with the, the political process. But that says they should also form a government that will include some of the people of the Mr. Bagbo's party in order to unite the country. Because the country is fairly polarized. There's the north-south divide. There's a the religious divide. Then there is um, indigenous versus immigrants what they call the ivorite, ivorite. So in order to heal those wounds and reconcile the society so that it's united, there's need for, to play a game of inclusivity rather than a game of exclusivity.
a winner takes all, in my view, will not solve the long-term problem of Côte d'Ivoire. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll open the floor to uh, questions now. Uh, we have microphones coming around, so wait for a microphone. Uh, please identify yourself, and uh, let's have uh, concise questions rather than uh, statements. Uh, gentleman at the front here. Thank you. Uh, Michael Marshall from United Press International. Um, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, Kenya, like many countries in Africa and the developing world, has a very young population. Uh, it, it, it's, it's skewed young. Uh, and we know that uh, ar around the world, the combination of young men and no jobs is politically volatile. Um, I wonder how you see uh, enough jobs being provided for the young people of Kenya, particularly those who are getting an education and often don't find employment opportunities. Uh, in what fields do you see um, suitable employment for your huge youth population developing? Thank you. Let's take a couple of questions, a couple of more uh, questions. Uh, uh, Joel up in the front here. The microphone is uh, coming. There you go. Joel Mark and CSIS. Two quick uh, questions. The first, uh, picking up on uh, Richard's introduction about the struggle uh, between reformers and those who want to maintain the status quo, which you alluded to yourself. Could you comment on uh, the implications of the proceedings in The Hague, the fate of the Ocampo Six, uh, particularly Mr. Ruto, Mr. Kenyatta, and Mr. Mathara? Uh, the events uh, on Monday, the rally, is reform uh, grinding to a halt in, there, in, um, in Kenya? And secondly, in respect to your comment about uh, U.S. tolerance for dictatorship, uh, is that in fact occurring again in respect to U.S. Africa policy with respect to Uganda and Ethiopia? Thank you. Uh, let's take one more, and the uh, lady at the front here in, in the middle. Uh, Honorable Prime Minister, His Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Rosemary Seguero. I'm based here in Washington, D.C. I'm from Kenya. Mr. Prime Minister, Honorable, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation on not only Kenya, but Africa. Thank you for your support, and we support you. We are here, we are behind Kenya, and be, we are behind Africa also. Uh, my question is, how does the African Union look into all this violence uh, in Africa when it comes to election? Are, you, are they going to come up with a policy, or are they go, what are they going to do? And uh, we need them to involve us into these issues because we are here as Kenyans, as Americans, and as the world watching them. So we want them to involve us into these issues. How are they going? How are they looking into the elections when it comes to governance, corruption, and other issues? Thank you. Well, uh, yes, uh, Kenya. The, the first question. Uh, like many other African countries, has a relatively young population. In fact, uh, according to the latest um, uh, census that was carried out in 2009, um, about um, 15, 15, I mean 35 percent and below, constitute about 72 percent of our population. So. Uh, uh, the population, they say, can either be a, uh, an asset or uh, a curse, uh, depending on, on how you look at it and how you make use of it. Uh, if the population is not empowered, then it becomes just a, a drag on the economy. And uh, the solution is first and foremost to provide education, a quality education to this uh, population. Because now we're talking about a globalized world, and we are in Kenya have resolved that we want to develop a knowledge-based economy. And that's why we are investing very heavily in education. We introduced a free primary education. 
Now we have also introduced a free secondary education. And we are also expanding our, um, uh, our higher institutions of learning. We want to ensure, to in, we are also increasing the transition from primary to secondary and from secondary to university and other colleges of, of higher learning. Now, um, employment. Because um, employment, uh, we created depending on how the economy grows. If the economy must grow at a pace commensurate with the increase in population, so that there are employment opportunities for our people. What we have done now is uh, some we have short-term measures, uh, mid-term and long-term. Um, of course, long-term is that one, we want the private sector to expand at a much faster rate to create more um, sustainable employment for the people. Uh, we are also investing very heavily in infrastructure. Infrastructure development provides a lot of employment uh, for the youth uh, of our country. Uh, then there's this IT field, uh, which also is creating quite a, a number of, of jobs and opportunities. Uh, we, um, then there's the, the small and medium scale businesses. This is uh, where people get self-employed. Uh, this is where, this is the factory of uh, entrepreneurs. And the government is supporting small and medium scale enterprises uh, in the country because this is what will produce much more jobs for the people. Um, we, uh, public sector employment is fairly limited. We employ as a government a total of nearly half a million people. And that is a very bloated bureaucracy which we are trying to trim down by way of retrenchment. Um, but on every year basis, we produce over 750,000 new graduates. That is, those who exit at primary level, those who exit at secondary level, and those who exit at um, um, uh, university levels. So we are very much seized with this matter. And this is how we are actually dealing with the issue of creating jobs. Joe, I see, I mean, uh, ICC. ICC, as you know, um, did not invite itself to Kenya. Kenya actually invited ICC because the report of the Waki, Justice Waki Commission, which investigated the post-election violence, had recommended that uh, a local tribunal be set up to deal with the perpetrators of post-election violence. Uh, but then they recommended that in the event that the government or parliament was unable to set up the tribunal, then the list which they had compiled and, and sealed in an envelope should be forwarded to ICC. That envelope was given to Dr. Kofi Annan. When we went to parliament as a government with a bill to amend the constitution to create an independent tribunal to try the post-election violence uh, uh, suspects. We were not able to get the requisite two-thirds majority in parliament. There was a campaign that um, against a local tribunal, that a local tribunal will be manipulated by the powers that be, that the small fish are the only ones who will be fried, that the big fish Will not be tried, cannot be tried locally. So they all said that let's take this thing to the Hague. <coughs> they said, don't be vague, say Hague. <laughs> so we said, fine, <laughs> let's just go to the Hague. That's how the matter ended up in the Hague. And then uh, Mr. Ocampo first gave us another four months, which he said he did not want to come to Kenya unless. <coughs> I mean, if Kenya was able to set up a tribunal, again, we were unable to make use of that offer. So ICC then started its own investigations and then came up 
eventually with the six um, the six um, uh, um, uh, uh, suspects who appeared before the tribunal of the ICC last week. But when Socampo now mentioned the names, then the story changed. Then ICC became a political court. It's politics that is being played, that it is some of the presidential candidates who want to remove their challengers from the field. I am one of those who now stand accused as having influenced the ICC to take some of my opponents out of the way. But nothing, of course, could be further from the truth. The fact is that the list was prepared by the commission that carried out investigations and handed over to the ICC. Um, of course, um, the law basically says that uh, you are innocent until you are proved guilty through the due process. And this, these people have not yet been tried, and therefore they are innocent. And all we say is that we wish them well in their trials. Um, but all at the same time, um, what we don't want to see is the ethnicization of politics, um, which will polarize uh, politics uh, in the country and increase political temperatures at the time when a lot of reforms still need to be carried out before we go to the next general elections. Um, well, uh, I have said that um, regarding the support for dictators, um, all I'm, I'm trying to say is to draw attention to a trend that is now fairly apparent, uh, that um, when we are friends, um, you sometimes want to look the other way when I, I commit mistakes. I've been saying that let us be consistent and convey the same message to everyone and all the times. Um, you have seen some of the trends that are now taking place, particularly in Northern Africa. My view is that um, the wind of change that blew in Eastern Europe then uh, came mainly to Sub-Saharan Africa, left some part of the, the continent. And that um, this is more or less akin to what happened in Europe, particularly in the 19th century. It's more like it than the Eastern European phenomena, which is happening. And really, it is a wake-up call. Because in the Middle East, um, the US has been a, an ally of regimes who have no regard for human rights completely. Uh, Saudi Arabia, you talk about elections, they tell you, go and tell that to your grandfather. Uh, in, in the, some of the best allies of the, Middle East, of the US, in, I mean those areas. But my view is that um, the change will come. Change will come. And that's why it is important for us to be consistent. Let us not be talking the two languages that uh, contradict each other. If it is about human rights, it is about uh, democracy, transparency, and accountability, let it apply across board. Uh, this really is what is now happening. Um, it started in Northern Africa, and you've seen where it has spread, on, spread to. In my view, even if they use the gun to try to muzzle the people, it is just a temporary uh, arrangement. Ultimately, the will of the people shall prevail. The AU, that is uh, Rosemary, um, AU, yes, um, uh, has some problems because, as it, <laughs> um, 
it uh, consists of um, um, membership which are fairly disparate and are at different levels of uh, development. And that's why sometimes reaching a consensus becomes difficult. <laughs> it becomes, um, I remember when we had a problem uh, in Kenya, then the AU was going to meet, the General Assembly was going to meet in Addis Ababa, and some of my friends were encouraging me <laughs> to go to the AU and insist that I was the elected president. Then a friend of mine, I will not mention his name, was then a minister in the UK government. Told me that Raila, I would advise you, he was himself on the way to the AU meeting, that he should not go to Addis Ababa. Because um, there in that audience, there are many, more, many people with similar problems like the one you're having here. <laughs> so you will not get uh, a sympathetic <laughs> hearing there. This is a case where you'll be better off in the, the European Union meeting than an AU <laughs> meeting. So um, the, sometimes I've, I've taken contradictory stands, um, like in the case of AU, at first they resolved that um, uh, the Bagbo should go, that they will uh, exercise economic sanctions, um, yet some, some members violated those sanctions and went on to supply Bagbo with arms and um, funds. Um, uh, then uh, they said that uh, in the event that that did not work, they would use legitimate force in order to uh, ensure that um, Watara's government uh, was um, uh, 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 sworn in. And then eventually, uh, when another uh, meeting took place, then it was all again changed. They now say we are sending another mission to go and try to talk to Mr. Bagbo. And thereafter, uh, very little was actually happening. Uh, but this is uh, because of uh, um, the heterogeneity of the, the composure of the mix that you call the AU. But my view is that as democratization is taking place among the member states of AU, the AU will become much more and more coherent in the future. So AU actually represents the future of the continent. <coughs> Thanks very much for those uh, clear answers. Let's take uh, another round of uh, questions. Uh, let's have a uh, gentleman up the front. Connie Freeman, Syracuse University. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, thank you so much for your very informative remarks. Um, it's delightful to see you here in Washington. The last time I saw you was in Kenya. Um, Many of your remarks related to the progress or lack thereof of democracy on the continent. And systemically, a number of people are beginning to discuss whether there's a problem with implementing, particularly first past the post type elections in African countries. And I would be interested in your thoughts on um, tweaking the system as it were, to make it more participatory, more Ubuntu, et cetera, if there are ways that you can conceive as a politician that the system can be changed to make it more effective within the African context. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm neglecting this side of the room. Let's have a question. The lady at the front uh, there. Hello, my name is Makeda Jiroge, and I'm a student at Howard University. And my question is just, what are some of the current developments in ec ethnic reconciliation that are going on in Kenya right now? And what are some of Kenya, the Kenyan government's long-term plans for ethnic reconciliation? So that I can, I can uh, the, what, some of the initiatives for ec um, ethnic reconciliation in, in Kenya right now. Uh -huh. uh, and let's take a final question. Uh, the gentleman right at the, the end there.
Good morning, Excellence. My name is Alan Ikombo. I am with the Orange Symphony. And you said a moment ago that I, you sent a note or a message to President Alassane Ouattara to offer Mr. Gbagbo amnesty. Given the, uh, the violence and the bloodshed that occurred uh, as a result of his uh, clinging to power, don't you think that uh, giving him an amnesty would have uh, the similar effect of uh, emboldening others to hold on to power, just like uh, coalition governments do? And uh, one more, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. What is uh, your thought about uh, the presence of uh, France in the events that led up to Mr. Gbagbo's arrest that has uh, propelled them to the top of the headlines, along with uh, Mr. Gbagbo himself and Mr. Ouattara? Thank you. So we have a, a question on electoral systems. Uh, do they need tweaking in the African context? Uh, efforts for ethnic uh, reconciliation in Kenya, and then two questions on, on Cote d'Ivoire. Well, um, um, uh, Connie, um, <laughs> the first past the post, but, um, I don't know uh, whether there is um, a kind of uh, an electoral system that will be uniquely African. Because um, look at where we're coming from. Uh, the, the, the call, what is the genesis of this problem? Um, at independence, for example, we, most countries inherited fairly a multi democratic uh, governance structure with multi-party systems. Um, then immediately thereafter, a school of thought began to develop. Um, that um, the system which was inherited from the colonial, uh, uh, colonial, co colonial masters was uh, not uh, African, uh, that um, the adversarial system of resolving disputes as, is, as exists in the West was alien, that the traditional African society provided for uh, Co uh, resolution of uh, differences by way of consensus. And that was, for example, uh, Senghor called it the palava. Palava, that uh, people sat under the tree and discussed, and eventually a cons uh, consensus was arrived at. And that the multi party system of governance was un African. So, uh, uh, Nkrumah also argued very eloquently uh, along the, the same lines. And then they say that uh, multipartism was a luxury that the young developing countries could ill afford, that the gigantic task of nation building required consolidation of efforts. And that is how uh, multipartism was led into extinction by way of coercion, bribery um, and the use of force, the, 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 uh, the opposition was led into existence, so uh, extinction. Then they first, some of them de facto, eventually de jure, by way of legislation. Now, after a long, a long period of struggle and so on, multipartism was reestablished, which basically entails competition in the uh, um, 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 politi political process, so that political parties have become instruments for peaceful brokering of competitive ideas and ideologies. And in this, this, there's no other way. If it's a competition, then there must be some benchmarks. There must be a referee, and then there must be a winner and a loser. The, the, this idea that um, in, in Africa, I mean, political parties are ethnic and so on, in my view, does not hold what? Because people will say if it is led by so-and-so, it is 
the party of those people. But we have managed to develop political parties that cut across the country. But all the times they will still try to look at, oh, this party is for this because the so-and-so comes from this region. But if, if you go to the United States, even this country, the states which are purely Democrats, the other states which are purely um, um, uh, uh, Republicans, generally, if you go to Britain, they will tell you that is a safe, labor safe seat. And they will tell you this is a, a Tory seat. Seat, there's a blue and red just like here, this country. So just like, for example, in Kenya, there are areas which you say are predominantly ODM, which is my party. Other areas which are PNU. But then there are other gray areas where we compete. So what is evolving in our country is not different from what exists here in established democracies. But if now it's a stronghold and you have what you call homeboy mentality even here, <laughs> that is a, uh, they would, they, in that way they will never ever, because we have 42 tribes and a leader of a political party must come from one of those 42 tribes. So if, uh, because he's from that tribe, then that party belongs to that tribe, then of course you'll say, we'll never have, then you're going to have 42 different tribes. Uh, parties, in my view. So it is basically a perception by the media, which is basically used to enhance democracy rather than consoling the society, to make the society integrate. Um, um, ethnic reconciliation, we are actually been working very hard to try to reconcile the communities which have been um, um, fighting against each other. The, the, the conflicts among communities have got different origins. For example, you have uh, issue land, which um, has been a source in some parts of the Rift Valley of our country, where you have got indigenous population versus immigrants those people who came from an area because of land scarcity and then were settled in another particular area. And um, the new constitution has become a very good instrument of d resolving some of these disputes and historical injustices which have existed for a long time. And that's the reason why we are pushing and f or fast tracking the process of implementation of the new constitution. Uh, to be able to resolve the issue of land disputes and uh, give people security of tenure and that people can live and work in every part of the country uh, that is guaranteed uh, by the new constitution. So the new land bill is um, now is um, uh, uh, before cabinet for approval. There are other areas where you've got pastoral communities who fight over grazing land, uh, I mean, uh, um, grazing t territories, cattle rustling, um, and so on. And uh, again, those are ones, again, we are trying to reconcile so that they can live peacefully and um, uh, disengage from the practice of robbing, because it's nothing but robbery, um, taking properties of other communities uh, using um, ammunition. So we are working with the civil society, we're working together with um, the administration, with the religious groups, and the uh, elders of those communities to reconcile, reconcile them and to ensure that they live in peace and, and harmony. Um, the issue, Mr. Bagbo's amnesty, yes, um, I talked about amnesty because I do not believe that retribution or recrimination will solve the problem of Côte d'Ivoire. It will, in fact, open up new wounds. If you look at the results of the last elections, 
uh, by the UN records and other records of other observers. The difference was about 8%. In other words, Mr. Watara got about 54% of the votes, the Bagbo got 46%. In the first round, when there were more than four candidates, Mr. Bagbo won by 38%, Watara came second with 32%, then Mr. Badie got 25%. In the second round, Mr. Badie pulled, put his weight behind Mr. Watara, and that's how he increased his uh, percentage to 54%. But 46% is a very substantial amount of votes. That basically means that Mr. Bagbo has got support on the ground. So if you now begin to try Mr. Bagbo, he becomes um, a rallying point to his supporters, which is what he really don't want in a country that is coming from civil war. Um, the civil war will not end. That's why we are talking about a reconciliation. And if you want to reconcile, give Bagbo safe exit, then get some of his people because he represents a number of people or, and also a, a big region of the country, get those people in the government. So you play a game of inclusivity. That is how to heal the wounds which are still very fresh uh, in that country. France, France, of course, uh, was a colonial master in the Côte d'Ivoire. And France has had a long, extensive relationship with Côte d'Ivoire. They've got <coughs> heavy investment also in that country. And there are very many French citizens who also live in Côte d'Ivoire. Um, because every country acts most of the times in its national interests, in the best national interests. But I hear, I don't think that uh, France really should be blamed unnecessarily. We all the times try to put blame on so-called foreigners when we mess up and we're not able to solve our own problems. There's no serious evidence of French involvement in this, serious one. I was there myself. The country was, of course, divided. In the north, it was controlled by what you call Force Nouvelle, who are basically the forces that are sympathetic with Mr. Watara. The south was controlled by Bagbo's army, or loyal to him. In the middle was the UN buffer zone. The UN is the one which stood in the middle. And then there was also the uh, French. But the UN had a much bigger force, so 12,000 men strong, um, compared to what the, the French had there uh, in the country. And then, of course, there was a statement. The ECOWAS had already passed a resolution that they would use legitimate force if Bagbo refused to surrender. Unfortunately, they were not able to because Nigeria, which should have provided the troops, are going through elections. And Jonathan told me that he will not use the army during the elections because his opponents will use that against him. But as soon as they've done elections, he will send his troops to Côte d'Ivoire. <laughs> So if, if French troops were involved, in my view, it's positive. Because this is a problem that needed to be resolved, in my view. So I do not really want to see that this is used negatively against France. Well, we're almost uh, out of time, unfortunately. So uh, may perhaps just time for one more question. And I, I guess uh, I'll ask it my, my, myself. Uh, <laughs> 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 Lucky me, I get the microphone. Um, you, you've, you've spoken about, uh, you mentioned the important role of the, the United States and the international community in, in promoting uh, democracy and, and good uh, governance in Africa. What are the, you, you spoke also of the need to, uh, for consistency in, in actions and, and, and words. What's the most important thing? What, what's the biggest gap which the international community and the U.S. 
can help Phil in, in, in advancing this objective in Africa? What, what would you like to see the US doing more of in Africa to promote good governance? Well, um, already I think, l let's talk ab about the positive side. That the US has actually has been fairly proactive in trying to uh, promote democracy in some countries of Africa. Um, uh, I would say, for example, in my country, they have been very much at the forefront each time, uh, reminding us of what needs to be done, and um, in supporting a civil society, for example, because I believe very strongly that um, a strong civil society uh, itself is um, a sign qua non for a thriving of uh, democracy in a country. Um, together with um, an independent, uh, vibrant media. Um, uh, this, of course, has grown in Kenya. Um, the days when they were able to come up with what we called uh, Section 2A to make the country a, a single party, those days uh, the civil society was almost non-existent in our country. Now, uh, um, the U.S. Um, has also, of course, um, been um, supporting the empowerment of uh, women uh, in our country. And um, the involvement of the women um, uh, actively in political process, in my view, is um, a positive sign. Um, but um, what I'm trying to say is that uh, this m message has not been uniform or consistent. The U.S. Um, looks at the situation, so it's just one is uh, the deal with it um, on a case by case basis. If you look, for example, Egypt. Egypt, of course, um, is one of the biggest uh, economies in Africa. Egypt is a very old country, Misri, but Egypt has never known uh, democracy. Um, NASA and co overthrew the uh, federal government of King Farouk in 1953. And then um, established the rule. In 1956, he nationalized the Suez Canal and became a hero. But then stayed on because elections were held, which were basically rituals. And in 1971, he died, and his vice president, uh, Anwar Sadat, took over and put uh, Mr. Mubarak as his vice president. And then he went on until 1980, um, when he was k killed, and Mubarak took over. And Mubarak then went on. Each time elections were being held, which were just rituals. There were no elections in Egypt. And nobody really said anything about what was happening in Egypt. I met with Mr. Mubarak last year. I was his guest in May last year. And he told me that uh, this year, 2001, he was going to do an election and he was going to win. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and uh, if uh, what happened in January had not happened, of course, um, he would have won the September elections and uh, he would have been recognized. So what I'm saying is that let us go deeper beyond the surface. Let's not just be scratching the surface uh, without looking at what is rotten, the rot that is uh, underneath. This is really, if the U.S. did this, it will really <coughs> help African democratization. Thank you very much. Well, it's been a terrific discussion. Thanks so much, uh, Prime Minister, for being so generous with your time and answering such a broad range of questions. Um, we wish you well on, on the rest of your visit uh, and wish Kenya well on, on, on facing some of the difficult challenges in, in the year or so ahead. Um, just a note before we close, it, uh, if you wouldn't mind everyone remaining in their seats just for a couple of minutes until uh, the Prime Minister has departed. Um, but. Uh, please join me in, in thanking the Prime Minister for his time this morning and uh, hope to see you again soon.